Hello friends, it's me Sonia. Welcome back to my channel and thank you for listening. I have something I would like to share with you today and it is regarding the Antichrist and Mystery Babylon. But I want to put out a disclaimer. This is, um, I have here some really sensitive information. I would say uh, graphic information. So if you're very sort of hypersensitive to um, the kind of content I'm going to be addressing today, I want to urge you caution, okay? It's not for the lightheaded, so um, I prayed about this before I began to share this. But this subject is regarding beheadings. Now, in the book of Revelation, friends, we know that there is a scripture that references beheadings in the time of the end. I'm going to read to you from that excerpt of book of Revelations chapter 20 um, and also I have a lot of things I want to show you on this screen here so if you would stick around and just wait for the conclusion because I think this is really important for us to to help us to differentiate between the Antichrist and Mystery Babylon this little detail regarding beheadings kind of gives it away as to where the beheadings will be taking place okay Revelation chapter 20 mentions the beheadings. Verse 4, And I saw thrones, and there sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded, for their witness to Jesus, and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast, or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years can you see the very mention of the word beheading here beheaded is actually in reference to the Antichrist the beast system and not mystery Babylon why do I point this out? Because it's a very important detail. As you may be aware, Saudi Arabia does decapitations, beheadings, right? We know that. I'm going to show you an article regarding this, and it was released earlier this year in April. But I want to lead you to show you who, in fact, is doing the beheadings right now. And most of you... I pray my listeners you're very well informed as to the dynamics of the Middle East so this is not a surprise to you okay let me show you what I mean Saudi Arabia as we know does beheadings like I just said this article from Business Insider said that it actually broke its own record for executions beheading over 180 people in 2019 why doesn't the West call them out on this, you guys? Why is it people like Amnesty International that has to call them out? Where's the worldwide outrage? It's not going to happen, I'm telling you now. Saudi Arabia bucked a global decline in executions last year, be beheading at least 184 people, more than in any previous year, Amnesty International said on Monday. Saudi authorities executed 37 people in a single mass beheading, 32 of them members of its Shiite Muslim minority. Do you blame Iran for having this intense hatred and hostility towards Saudi Arabia? In 2019, Saudi Arabia executed more than more people than it has ever done before, capped by the April 23rd mass beheading of more than three dozen people on terrorism charges according to a new report from amnesty international only china and iran executed more people last year with just 20 countries responsible for all recorded incidences instances of capital punishment according to the report in total saudi authorities executed 184 people up 23 percent from the year before with the plurality of the killings in punishment for drug-related offences. The majority of those who were killed or by beheading were foreign nationals. Foreign nationals. 
Another reason why Christians and many of them who are living in Saudi Arabia are migrant workers building the empire, the kingdom in Saudi Arabia. More reason for them, and I know this is a hard message, to reconsider living there. I urge all my Christian brothers and sisters to leave that place. There are job opportunities available outside of the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. I know times are difficult and I know the way the Saudi authorities promote and advertise job opportunities in that desert region is very enticing. But please take this into consideration, okay? Please. Now, another thing. Antichrist does the beheadings. Do we see any elements of that already taking place? One word, ISIS. ISIS, as you know, have been doing incredibly gruesome beheadings and just the hacking of human beings, especially the Christians and the Yazidis. I'm going to lead you to show you a report that was mentioned. Well, first of all, let's talk about ISIL beheading incidents. Don't forget, this wasn't that long ago, you guys. Beginning in 2014, a number of people from various countries were beheaded by Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant. A radical Sunni Islamist group operating in Iraq and parts of Syria. In January 2015, a copy of an ISIL penal code surfaced describing the penalties it enforces in areas under its control, including beheadings. Beheading videos have been frequently posted by ISIL members to social media. Several of the video beheadings were conducted by Muhammad Mwazi. Now, when I was looking at this this morning, I was reminded, oh, don't forget Jihadi John. I was reminded of these human slaughterhouses. Do you recall, friends? The human slaughterhouses. Let me find you a video um, that was recorded on the Glazov gang. Now listen to Walid and what he reported here. This was back in 2014 at the peak of the Islamic State incursion and invasion of that region. So just listen to what he says here. This is in incredible and not many people are aware of this happening and I believe it's still happening right now. If I can just get the um, volume. This is important, you guys. This is important because it's going to happen on a grander scale. Right now, of course, we're in the West and we're thinking, you know, it's not going to happen here. But don't forget what happened to the drummer Lee Rigby in Great Britain. I'll come to that in a moment. But listen to this interview. But, uh, share with us so about these slaughterhouses. Well, <clears throat> I always monitor the Middle East for uh, the persecution of Christians because we run an organization called Rescue Christians. And as I was uh, looking at this report that was covered by Arab media, uh, Al Jazeera covered some of it, nobody covered the full thing. They covered an interview of uh, uh, an FSA soldier named Saif al Adlubi. Saif al Adlubi <clears throat> was in the FSA, he's a Muslim fundamentalist himself, and uh, he was arrested by the ISIS. The ISIS is the uh, the Islamic uh, uh, group that's, that uh, basically covers the Levant and Syria. They want to basically, they're the most extremist group that want to basically take over <clears throat> the whole Levant region, which is Iraq and, and Syria. They're the most extremist group, of course. And as he was giving his testimony, and he, he got out of the, the prison system because the FSA had invaded that prison and uh, and you know, in the last moments, he he was he was released. And in the story he tells, it was quite astonishing. I couldn't believe what he was saying <clears throat> because he was saying that he witnessed human slaughterhouse. Uh, I believe that the prison system he was in is in Adana, and they had this human slaughterhouses separate from the uh, 
local neighborhoods, if you will. It's a secluded place where there is no homes around. <clears throat> they set up these human slaughterhouses. And they have kangaroo courts in which he was accused of being part of the media. I researched the guy. He, he, he was a blogger, and he considered himself an FSA media. He had his Facebook. He put download stories of victories and what, what have you. And so he was considered media in the FSA. And since he was considered media, and he was uh, uh, considered an infidel, and he was asking the court, you know, what is my destiny here? Will I take one year prison, two year prison? They said, no, no, no. And the Arabic, they told him, Abshir bidhabh, which means the good news, you will be sacrificially slaughtered. And he described several cases he saw. One of them is a Christian Armenian, that there was a slaughter, the slaughterhouse, you know, guy that was doing the slaughtering was feeling the necks of the row of people he's about to slaughter. Wow. And one was an Armenian. And he says, your neck is tender because you're an aged man. I wouldn't have to sharpen my blade. Whoa. <laughs> he talked about how he witnessed how these people were slaughtered, hung upside down like sheep, disemboweled, and processed as if it's in a meat factory. Whoa. And he was weighing the heads, he says. They, they, they would weigh the heads. Uh, this is five kilograms, this head is six kilograms, and so on and so forth, and somebody would come, you know, he, he was about to get slaughtered, but he was also working in the slaughterhouse, the human slaughterhouse. That's the really graphic information there, you guys, but this is fact. This is what took place during the very beginnings of the ISIS invasion of the Levant region, right, Iraq. Syria region and it was so horrendous that they actually set up human slaughter houses where they hung many Christians and many hypocrites of Islam and including the Yazidis as cattle they done this they did beheadings and there is also if you continue to listen and look up the reports that Walid did during that time there was also reports of these Islamic terrorists who were drinking the blood of their victims. It was a sacrificial uh, ritual that they were doing. Literally, you guys, they're offering up sacrifices to their demon god, Baal. Baal, Molech, all of it. It's a co complete cocktail of demons that they are sort of doing right now. They're worshipping these demonic entities. Now, I'm going to continue to show you something else. Who was behind ISIS? Who do we know funded them? Let me show you something else. Now, in the previous video, I touched on this. <sighs> Let me make the text a little larger for you, friends. Columbia University researchers had already confirmed links with Turkey and ISIS. This report was uh, written and it's on this website. I'm going to put the links in the description so you can see them. And it says here, here are brief excerpts from the extensive research documenting the direct links between Turkey and ISIS. Turkey supplied military equipment to ISIS. And you have to stop and question, why would they do that? Why would Turkey back ISIS? Okay, there are people out there and they have many different perspectives, different um, analysis that they make. And my perspective, perspective is, I believe they were using ISIS to break into pieces the region, just like how a gardener, a farmer would till the ground to prepare it, right? That's exactly what ISIS were doing. Here are brief excerpts on the extensive research documenting the direct links between Turkey and ISIS. This is a foreshadowing of the beast, the Antichrist beast. This is what's coming to that region. And I pray that our brothers and sisters in the region are ready. They're prepared. An ISIS commander told the Washington, Washington Post on August the 12th, 2014. You see at the same time, right? 
while he did his report 2014. This was hot off the press, it was happening in real time. Most of the fighters who joined us in the beginning of the war came via Turkey and so did our equipment and supplies. I've read to you from this article before, but this is the only one that I could find that had it uh, researched, documented and proven that there was this connection between ISIS and Turkey. According to CHP Vice President Bülent Tezkan, Turkish agents drove three trucks loaded with rockets, arms and ammunition to ISIS in Syria in January 2014. Check this out. Documents made public on September 27, 2014 revealed that Saudi Prince Bandar bin Sultan financed the transportation of arms to ISIS through Turkey. You have an element of collaboration there between Saudi and Turkey with ISIS. Saudi Arabia is the harlot, is mystery Babylon. If it wasn't for Islam, there would be no need for this absolute horrendous persecution of Christians in that region because it's Islamic motivated, you guys. Turkey provided logistical assistance to ISIS fighters. According to June 13, 2014, article in Radical Newspaper, Turkish Interior Minister Muammar Gwela issued the following directive. Hatay is a strategic location for the Mujahideen. Mujahideen, check it out crossing from within our borders to Syria. Logistical support for Islamist groups will be increased and their training, hospital care and safe passage would mostly take place in Hatay. I would like to know why the Trump administration is allowing Erdogan, Sultan wannabe, to really have his way in that region right now. Why is the US pulling out of the Middle East? Because what that will do inadvertently is make way for the Islamic Caliphate to rise. Everything, of course, we know is under the will and sovereignty of our God. So he's allowing this to happen, you guys. So read this. Do your homework. Do your research so we are aware. Because remember that video I did regarding the Antichrist being revealed at the Euphrates River. His armies, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, the demonic entities come out from that region turkey iraq syria this is the focus of biblical prophecy regarding the end times and this is the focus of um basically of the islamic world this region is a hotbed and it's going to get worse much much worse i'm taking you to a link regarding the armenian genocide what took place and you would believe this you guys much decapitation and the genocide of Christian minorities took place. And right now, what's happening with the threat of Az Azeri incursion, invasion? I pray that our Armenian brothers and sisters remain faithful to the Lord. Oh, Lord Jesus, please give me strength. I get really upset talking about this, you guys. The Armenian Genocide, also known as the Ottoman Destruction of Christian Minorities, is considered one of the first great tragedies of the 20th century. It also happens to be one of the most controversial events in the last century because of Turkey's vehement disapproval of the application of the term genocide, despite the evidence. There are currently many photos of this genocide that can be found online and in history books though the Turkish government tends to dismiss them and state that the tragedy was not as bad as is generally said to be. Regardless, these images tend to be incredibly graphic and show us the terrible things the Christian minorities, especially Armenians, went through. One thing in particular that stands out in these photos is the number of them that picture Turks posing with skulls or heads of their victims or even just the pictures of the disembodied heads themselves. The beheading of someone is a particularly symbolic act 
and what it means in the context of a genocide is very intriguing I'm not going to show you the the graphics there of course I'm not going to show that to you but there is this video I found online regarding the report United Nation report that accused the Islamic State of massive scale war crimes and it's interesting just and watch Take a public listen. executions, and some have been recruited to fight for Islamic State as child soldiers, all in violation of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. I personally uh, interviewed a kid in a refugee camp who had been taken by the group, and his, his friends had had their fingers chopped off. UN investigators have found the Islamic State commanders individually responsible for a host of crimes against humanity, noting also that some of them are foreigners. Some of the leaders, or those close to the top leadership, are foreigners. So they are in control, and that gives rise to even uh, greater necessity to um, uh, enable the countries of origin to act before it's too late. Since US-led airstrikes began targeting IS positions in September, the insurgents began moving into local houses and farms, causing civilian casualties. They also blocked delivery of humanitarian aid in provinces under their control. So um, it is um, salutary that we are able to highlight uh, areas such as food deprivation, starvation, uh, which is actually uh, an illegality, it's a breach of humanitarian law. The UN Refugee Agency has been providing aid to Syrians displaced by the civil war between the government and the opposition. It is getting short of funds as the number of people displaced by violence grows. Okay, right. Of course, did you pick that up, you guys? Many of the fighters, the Mujahideen in ISIS, are foreign. They come from foreign nations, you guys, and many of them are coming from the West, especially the UK. Do you recall... God bless his soul. The drummer, Lee Rigby. Do you recall what happened in Britain? <sighs> this is about seven, seven or eight years ago, I believe. Um, don't forget, you guys. Why am I showing you this? I'm, I'm showing you this to wake the church up. I'm showing you this to let you know that Islamic persecution of Christians. Now, there's persecution of Christians among various different religious groups. Hindu Christian persecution, communist Christian persecution, I get it, right? But we have never seen anything on this scale. And the fact that something as horrendous as this took place in Great Britain, and yet the whole country of the, of the United Kingdom is such an appeaser of Islam because of its relationship with Saudi Arabia, it should tell you who the harlot is. The evidence is out there. You've just got to dig a little deeper, do your due diligence, read into the scriptures and look for the signs, the clues. They're right there, you guys. Let me read this to you. On the afternoon, I want to remind you what took place. <coughs> <coughs> On the afternoon of May 22nd, 2013, a British Army soldier, Fusilier Lee Rigby, of the Royal Regiment of Fusiliers was attacked and killed by Michael Adibojo and Michael whatever near the Royal Artil Artillery Barracks in Woolwich, South East London. <coughs> <coughs> That's very close to where I used to live back home in London. In fact, I went there after this happened to pay my respects. I went to lay flowers down I had the Bible in my hand and I prayed and I had some members of the EDL, the English Defence League, who came and approached me and they were so pleased to see me there because, well, they could tell by looking at me, I'm Asian, I'm Pakistani, I told them I'm a Christian, I'm a born again Christian, I'm from an Islamic background and what took place here is very concerning to me and they were so grateful that I was there that I showed up right as a sign of solidarity <coughs> Rigby was off duty and walking along Wellington Street when he was attacked 
Adebolajo and Adebowale ran him down with a car. In fact, I'll just leave that there for you to read. They told passers-by. You see, this is the thing that is so chilling. They committed the act, and as though parading his, his carcass there, his body, they were waiting for people to come with their cameras so they could proclaim their deed. They told passers-by that they had killed a soldier. They just confessed it openly. They admitted it to avenge the killing of Muslims by the British armed forces. Unarmed police. <clears throat> Unarmed. Oh, the insanity. Unarmed police arrived at the scene nine minutes after an emergency call was received and set up a cordon. Armed police officers arrived five minutes later. Right, okay, five minutes later. I guess they saw what had taken place and so they called for the armed officers. The assailants, armed with a cleaver and brandishing a gun, charged at the police who fired shots that wounded them both. They were apprehended and taken to separate hospitals. They were both of Nigerian descent, were raised as Christians and converted to Islam. That's another thing that concerns me is this, uh, these Dawah teams that you get across um, the West. When Christians recant, I would say nominal name by name only Christians, when they convert to Islam, they are immediately brainwashed, indoctrinated. And this is why you find that you have many foreign recruits in the ISIS armies, the Mujahideen. Now, Libya. <clears throat> Libya, which is where those beheadings took place. You remember the Christians in the orange? Listen to what this report says here. So much to talk about. ISIS in Libya. News on our weekend special correspondent Chris Lipsey was recently the first American broadcast journalist legally allowed into the country in almost a year. In part two of his report, he and videographer Alessandro Pavone travel to a city where ancient ruins collide with modern warfare. It's also a place where human trafficking stretches and even breaks the bonds of family and tribe. This story was made possible with special funding from the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting. Once a jewel of the Roman Empire, Libya's port city of Sabratha is home to an ancient amphitheater that more recently was the backdrop of a city overrun by terror. You see, once it was the jewel of the Roman Empire, but remember what came after the Roman Empire? The Ottomans. That's why it came and it, it smashed, broke in pieces and just did, destroyed everything in its path to make way to usher in the kingdom of the Antichrist. This Bible prophecy, friends, is panoramic. It shows us over time, over centuries, what is to come. So we need to ask the Holy Spirit for help so we can dissect history and find out where this beast began and when it started to really spread and grow out. ISIS took control in 2015 and asserted its authority by beheading 12 members of the security forces and setting up its own checkpoints. Today, the tables are turned. Libyan police, loyal to the government in Tripoli, now check for ISIS militants. One of them tells me the city is safe. But checkpoints are common targets for terrorist attacks, and any one of these vehicles could be packed with explosives. Police are also looking for stolen fuel. ISIS is known to smuggle it from Libya's vast reserves and use the profits to fund their attacks. 
Libya's spot on the map makes it particularly attractive to terrorists. Parts of the sprawling country, three times the size of France, are ungoverned, and the country has largely uncontrolled borders, offering several gateways for action. So also, remember, friends, that Libya is one of the nations that is within the GOG coalition of armies that come against Israel, Libya and Sudan. That's why this is important to see. This, this Bible prophetic scriptures that we're seeing, reading in the Word of God, it's beginning now, you guys. The pieces are moving on the chessboard and we are seeing it. We are living in that time that we are seeing the beginning, the beginning stages of the beast forming. Says Carnegie Endowment Senior Associate Frederick Wary. Libya is still a fertile ground, you know, for ISIS to, uh, to regroup, to conduct attacks, to include external attacks outside of Libya, whether in, or in Tunisia or even um, Europe. And I think this is a huge concern for American policymakers. The U.S. has always recognized that the Libyan branch of the Islamic State was the most potent affiliate outside of Iraq and Syria. And so it could very well reemerge as, as a very significant threat to North Africa and, and to Europe. Now, they're not able to control territory like they did in uh, 2016, but they're still able to conduct attacks, as, as we've seen. They're, they're adopting a clandestine uh, network strategy. Okay, I wanted just to show you that much. This is why Turkey Erdogan is in that region. He's trying to secure resources as well as manpower. He's looking in the future. He's preparing for the 2023 vision. And he's just doing what he thinks is wise and being very, very strategic. This is not going to disappear. Everything that we're seeing right now is going to get worse, you guys. So my concern is for our Christian brothers and sisters. What do I have here? Right. Recently, <clears throat> if I can get this to just stay right there. Close the ad. President Erdogan established his rule in Turkey by shifting moderate Turkish Sufi Islam. I thought this was incredibly on point, this article here. If I can get that a little larger so you can read it. Sufi Islam is the mystical brand of Islam, but because Erdogan is being incredibly strategic, he's sort of um, using as a vehicle to further his expansionist agenda for the region. He's using political strain of Islam right now. Well, it would make sense, wouldn't it? Dr. Ahmed Yala. Assistant professor at Dissal's University has said that Turkish President Erdogan slowly established his rule in the country by shifting moderate Turkish Sufi Islam based on teachings of Rumi, the poet Rumi, towards the Salafi Islam, the political Islam. Dr. Yala made the remarks during a webinar on Turkey's undoing of Kemalist project and its tremors in geopolitics of Islamic world organized by Osana's Foundation. I'm going to show you what, his, what he said in his statement. <clears throat> Let me get it to you now. Here it is, right. If I can get that larger. This is his statement. Check the date. July the 27th, 2020. Listen to this, you guys. He's letting the world know what his intentions are. Do you remember in September last year, 2019, he was at the United Nations. <clears throat> I think it was the 74th General Assembly. He declared exactly what his intentions were. He told everybody, this is what I'm going to do in Syria. This is what my plans are for Iraq. This is also my plan for Europe regarding the migrants, the refugees. He's told everyone and everyone's got their arms folded. President Trump is just sitting back saying, yeah, dude, go, go for it. Go for it. Take over. I don't want anything to do with the Middle East. You handle it. So I don't know what is going on between the Trump administration and the Turkish um, sort of goal for that region i don't know we don't know what what sort of discussions they have behind closed doors 
I don't agree with Trump's um, decision to pull back. I don't agree that he's giving the green light to Turkey. Absolutely don't. But then again, spiritually, prophetically speaking, it has to happen, right? Whatever's written in the Word of God has to happen. All right, I'm rambling. <clears throat> this is what he said. This is his statement, right? The Sultan of Turkey, the Ottoman Empire, revived. There is now a Turkey which has improved its infrastructure in every field, has obtained the will and ability to exercise its sovereign rights and its consonance of its own realities and power. <clears throat> Let me once again underline, we don't have designs over anyone's rights, lands, peace or prosperity. That's a lie right there. <clears throat> we only want and work to protect our own rights and interests because he feels that the Ottoman Empire revival is the Turkish president's right. He believes he's absolutely entitled to reclaim the regions that were lost when um, Atatürk Gamal was installed. In this spirit, we will never abstain from responding with our legitimate power arising from the international law to those who stand in our way with impositions. Whoever seeks to exclude us through fates accomplice in matters that could be resolved with negotiations and fair agreements should know that this will be the response they will face each and every time. He may as well be Hitler. We are determined to do whatever it takes in order to ensure that the injustices we suffered in the past, put in parenthesis there, the Lausanne Treaty. <clears throat> The injustices we suffered in the past are compensated for, as well as to protect our existing rights and achieve our goals. We are well aware of the fact that the methods of struggle among states and communities have changed across the world. Yeah, he's aware of the geopolitical dynamics in the, our world today, and I believe this pandemic has had a lot to play with the weakening of the economy in the West, while over here, even though his economy has been hit really bad, they're still regathering. They're rearming, re-strengthening, and reinforcing their Ottoman strength. They, they want to realize that vision, right? We constantly renew ourselves in accordance with the changing discourse and concept of every kind of political, economic, social, and military competition. Wow. We maintain our struggle both at the table and on the ground in line with the requirements of the new era. Wow, new era. We will continue to we will continue our march forward with the same understanding and perseverance. He's warning people don't interfere. Don't even consider interfering. I was looking at him on Twitter. Okay. Now I want to end with something, and it was uh, in regards to Raymond Ibrahim. I'm so close to the camera, sorry, because I was really up close to the laptop. Raymond Ibrahim, the American author, translator, columnist, critic of Islam, Arabic historian, and um, he's written books. One of his famous books is The Sword and the Scimitar. He released his June 2020 review report regarding the persecution of Christians across the world, not just in the Middle East, across the world. And I want to bring your attention to our brothers and sisters who are being slaughtered by Islamists around the world, jihadists. Please keep them in your prayers, you guys. I pray that the Lord will strengthen the believers across the world. The report is incredibly upsetting. Let me show it to you. Of course it's upsetting because <clears throat> it's regarding horrendous details of Muslim persecution. I will put this link in the description. Please share it with your church. 
your Bible study groups. Why? Because in your Bible study groups, you can pray. You can intercede for our brothers and sisters, remember? Burned Alive. Muslim persecution of Christians, June 2020. It's so heartbreaking, you guys. I was actually wanting to read some of this, and I, I tried it yesterday. I just broke down. I was so upset. <clears throat> The slaughter of Christians. And you won't believe the, the, the countries that are covered here. Nigeria. This is not the whole year report. This is June. Just for June alone. Nigeria. The attacks of Christians in that region. Burkina Faso. In Mali. Pakistan is having an absolute horrendous time there. It's so never ending, you guys. Sudan. And pay attention to these regions as well. Mozambique. Many of these are tourist holiday destinations. You need to reconsider where you go for your holiday. Indonesia, obviously the largest Islamic population in the world. Uganda. <clears throat> Please read these reports. Please bear with one another. Let's in solidarity remember those who are being mistreated imprisoned he leaves this statement at the end <clears throat> like um a report conclusion if you like syria it goes on it goes on you guys the persecution of Christians in the Islamic world has become endemic. Do you realize the seriousness of this, you guys? And over here in the West, oh my goodness, we're thinking that wearing these masks that is infringing on our rights. You know what? Wake the heck up, you guys. Church, wake up. Accordingly, Muslim persecution of Christians was developed in 2011 to collate some by no means all of the incidences of persecution that occur or are reported each month it serves two purposes yeah why is it why does he do this right Raymond Ibrahim what's the point what's he hoping to achieve number one <coughs> <coughs> to document that which the mainstream media does not the habitual if not chronic persecution of Christians to show that such persecution is not random but systematic and interrelated that it is rooted in a world view inspired by Islamic Sharia accordingly Whatever the anecdote of persecution, it's tip, it typically fits under a specific theme, including hatred for Christians and other Christian symbols, apostasy, blasphemy, and proselytism laws that criminalize and sometimes punish with death those who offend Islam. <coughs> I'll leave the link in the description. Let me end with this scripture because I think it's suitable considering we're talking about really difficult themes here of suffering, human suffering, Christian brothers and sisters suffering. I want to put this word of God out there. It's from the book of uh, First Peter and I'll end the video with that. Chapter 4 verse 12. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you, for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part he is blasphemed, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or as a busybody in other people's matters. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. 
And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Verse 18 now. If the righteous one is scarcely saved, where would the ungodly and the sinner appear? Therefore let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. Friends, please share this message. Please like, subscribe, consider supporting me. The world is a mess, you guys. And I'm, I'm seeing Mystery Babylon forming right now. I'm seeing the Antichrist Beast Kingdom forming right now. And I believe that we just really have to stop and check and reevaluate our perception of the world we are living in right now, you guys. Please share this. I love you. I appreciate you. And um, I'm going to continue with the Mystery Babylon theme. I haven't forgotten. But I wanted to put this out there to help you get a perspective of the dynamics that are taking place right now in relation to the Antichrist and Mystery Babylon. So I hope you appreciate this message. Again, like and share this video. Please help me get my messages out there. I really appreciate you guys. Thank you.